How can things go so wrong? How is it possible? One man killed, two others plugged. I'm out 30 grand. We got a load of rocks. We can't even pet them. Why don't you quit crying and give me some bourbon? Welcome to Classic Movie Reviews Podcast. My name is John. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. There are also links in the podcast show notes to subscribe or find our social media. So please subscribe when you're finished listening. You can go to ClassicMovieRev.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is an essential film noir. And now back to 1943's Fast Talking High Trousers. Well, isn't this a fine song and dance? What are you getting so hot about? Keep your shirt on. Where do you get off making remarks like... The Asphalt Jungle, 1950. This movie was directed by the illustrious John Huston. He also co-wrote the screenplay. IMDB.com has this movie rated at 7.9, and I'm a little surprised it's so low. RottenTomatoes.com has it at 97% on the tomato meter and 87% audience approval. The czar of film noir, Eddie Muller, rates this movie as number 15 on his top 25 film noirs. The film was nominated for four Oscars. Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Sam Jaffe. Best Director, John Huston. Best Writing, Screenplay, Ben Matto and John Huston. Best Cinematography, Black and White, Harold Rosen. Some of Rosen's other cinemagraphic work include The Wizard of Oz, 1939, Command Decision, 1948, and the great Robert Mitchum submarine destroyer battle, The Enemy Below, 1957. The film did not win any of the four Oscars for which it was nominated. This movie spawned a short-lived television show of the same name that featured Jack Warden and William Smith. New York Times film critic Bosley Carruthers said on June 9, 1950, quote, Ever since W.R. Burnett's Little Caesar muscled into film with a quality of arrogance and toughness such as the screen had not previously known, this writer and this type of story about criminals in the higher realm of crime have been popular and often imitated. But Little Caesar has yet to be surpassed. However, we've got to say one thing. A lot of pictures have come close, and one of them is The Asphalt Jungle, also from a novel by Mr. Burnett. Directed by Mr. Houston in brilliantly naturalistic style, gives such an electrifying picture of the whole vicious circle of crime, such an absorbing illustration of the various characters involved, their loyalties and duplicities, and of the minutia of crime techniques that one finds it hard to tag the item of repulsive exhibition in itself, unquote. We have lots of returning actors and a couple of new ones to go over as well. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. The main cast consists of Sterling Hayden playing the role of tough hood Dix Hanley. Hayden was first covered in Crime of Passion 1957. Sam Jaffe is pretty amazing as the meticulous planner and ex-con Doc Irwin Riedenscheidner. Females are his only vice. Jaffe was first covered in The Day the Earth Stood Still, 1951. Louis Calhoun is sleazy as hell as Alfonso D. Emmerich, or Uncle Lon, a corrupt lawyer. Calhoun was briefly covered in Blackboard Jungle, 1955. James Whitmore was solid as hunchback Gus Manissi. Whitmore was covered in Battleground, 1949. Mark Lawrence played Cobby, a successful bookie that got in over his head. Pat Flaherty showed up as an uncredited policeman. Both he and Lawrence first appeared in another film noir, Key Largo, 1948. Another film noir favorite, Brad Dexter played semi-tough guy Bob Branham. Dexter, of the Magnificent Seven, 1960 fame, was covered in 99 River Street, 1953. Ray Teal, covered in The Command, 1954, was another uncredited policeman that got slugged by Diggs. Strother Martin was uncredited as William Doby, a man in a lineup for a narcotics charge, which echoes the movie where he was first covered, Hard Times, 1975. Gene Hagen played the role of Doll Canavan. She was born in Chicago, the home of the best gangsters, in 1923. Hagen graduated from high school in Indiana and graduated from Northwestern University with a degree in drama. She began working in radio in the later 1940s, and she did a little work on Broadway. Her first film role was a comical femme fatale in Adam's Rib, 1949, with Hepburn and Tracy. 
Her first leading role was in The Asphalt Jungle, 1950. One of Hagen's most famous roles was in Singing in the Rain, 1952. In this great musical with Gene Kelly, Debbie Reynolds, and Donald O'Connor, Hagen played an actress that couldn't make the transition to talkies. In the movie, Debbie Reynolds' character sang for her. However, Reynolds was really lip-syncing a track that Hagen had recorded. Hagen took a role in the television series Make Room for Daddy, 1953-56. She left the show after three years and spent the remainder of her career working mostly in television. She did supporting roles in films such as Sunrise at Campobello, 1960, and Dead Ringer, 1964. She became ill in the late 1960s and finally died in 1977 at the very young age of 54. Marilyn Monroe played girlfriend Angela Finley in her first major role. Monroe was born in Los Angeles in 1926. She was born in the charity ward, and her father had already abandoned the family. Her mother, who suffered from mental illness, was in and out of relationships and mental hospitals all through Monroe's young life. The young Monroe lived in foster homes and orphanages. In 1942, at the age of 16, she married for the first time. Four years later, she was divorced and working as a model. She had already dyed her hair blonde. Based on her looks, she was signed by 20th Century Fox. The roles and the film she was given did little to launch her film career, and she returned to modeling. She did a few movies for other companies, but it didn't amount to much. In 1950, she made a big splash with appearances in The Asphalt Jungle, 1950, and All About Eve, 1950. She had a large role in Love Nest, 1951, and tried to show her acting chops in Don't Bother to Knock, 1952, with Richard Widmark, but it was not well liked. However. It is a very interesting movie. She received more credit for Monkey Business 1952 and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes 1953. In 1953, she posed nude for the cover of Playboy and suddenly she could act. She began playing a version of the same character in How to Marry a Millionaire 1953, There's No Business Like Show Business 1954, River of No Return 1954, and The Seven Year Itch 1955. However, there is one notable exception. If anyone tells you that Marilyn Monroe couldn't act, have them watch her as a femme fatale in Niagara, 1953. She was under studio contract and only made scale wages for this film. Around 1955, she began missing work and being hard to direct, and as a result, roles became harder to find. She redeemed herself with her performance in Bus Stop, 1956, Some Like It Hot, 1959, and The Misfits, 1961. She wasn't any easier to work with, and she suffered from bouts of depression and substance abuse. The Misfits, 1961, turned out to be her and co-star Clark Gable's last film. On August 5, 1962, Monroe was found dead of sleeping pills and booze. She was 36 years old and had made only 30 movies. If you hadn't hit the subscribe button yet, this would be a good time to do so. Story. Get me straight. There is too much. Let me sum up. The police are patrolling an unnamed Midwestern town. Dix Hanley, Sterling Hayden, is skulking through the city and trying to avoid John Law. The police get a radio call about an armed robber meeting his description. He makes it to a diner run by hunchback Gus Manissi, James Whitmore. Dix immediately hands his gun to Gus, who puts it in the register. The police come in right behind him and search him for the gun. One of the policemen is Pat Flaherty, who was uncredited. The older officer says they will book him on a vague, which is an old charge, especially down south, where you could pick someone up for not being able to prove they had a job. It was often used against African Americans during the Jim Crow era. Downtown, they put Dix in a lineup with two other criminals, Carl Anton Smith, Henry Corden, and William Doby, Struther Martin, the later of those on a narcotics charge. The night clerk victim, Frank Caddy, of the armed robbery was present with a slew of cops, including Lieutenant Dietrich, Barry Kelly. Caddy is commonly known as Sam Drucker from the Hooterville store and post office on Green Acres, 1963-1970. Dick stares down the night clerk and he refuses to ID the criminal. Lieutenant Dietrich is called to the commissioner, John McIntyre. The commissioner reads him the riot act for the high crime rate. 39 thefts, 33 burglaries, 18 robberies, 7 assaults, 5 morals offenses in the past 30 days. 
Quite a record, even for the 4th Precinct, Lieutenant Dietrich. Uh, we know the guy who's been pulling most of the stick-ups, Commissioner. Name's Dix Hanley. He was in the show-up this morning, but our witness got cold feet and backed down. What can you do? Lock up the witness! Scare him worse! Apparently, Dix is behind most of the crime spree. The commissioner asked the location of recently paroled Dr. Edwin Riedenscheinder, Sam Jaffe. The cops have no idea where the notorious criminal is located. Doc is dropped off by a cab in a shady neighborhood. He knocks on a door and asks to see Cobby, Mark Lawrence. Cobby starts out cold, but when he finds out who Doc is, he is very accommodating. What do you want? I just got out today. Oh, so that's it. I'm getting tired of you guys that fell putting a bite on me. I'm no First National Bank. I got a proposition for you. All you guys have. Maybe you didn't get who I was. I never seen you before. Come on, come on, what is it? Maybe you've heard of me, the professor. Or her doctor, maybe. You mean you were reading Schneider? Well, why didn't you say so? Come on in, Doc. Come on in. Doc has a heist plan that will bring in half a million, and he needs 10% for operation. Cobby doesn't have the money, and Doc asks about Alonzo D. Emmerich, Lewis Calhern. While Doc waits, he is very interested in the girly calendar on the wall. Dix comes in through the back door. Dix is asking for money to bet as he is already in the hole. Cobby insults Dix about the money. Cobby then tells Doc that Emmerich will meet with them that night. Dix goes back to the diner. Gus won't give him the gun back. Gus says he will cover Dix's gambling debt. So he tells Dix to go home and wait. Gus calls and puts the touch on Louis Chevelli, Anthony Caruso. Dix is at his home when the buzzer rings. His part-time girlfriend, Dal Canavan, Jean Hagen, comes in with a suitcase. She looks like she wants to take the liquor out of his hands. She breaks down crying because she has lost her job at a clip joint. She is a hot mess. Dahl, if you're going to smoke, you've got to learn to carry matches. <laughs> Dahl, what are you crying about? Can you imagine raiding the regal? The cops must have all gone crazy. So it's a clip joint. So what? And it would have to happen on pay night. <laughs> he lets her stay, but he makes it clear that they are not a couple. Doc, Cobby, and Emmerich meet to go over the plan. Emmerich is a lawyer and not a regular criminal. Doc needs a box man, safecracker, a driver, and a hooligan. Emmerich proposes that he handle getting rid of the loot rather than going through a fence. After the two others leave, Emmerich creeps on his young girlfriend, Angela Finley, Marilyn Monroe, who calls him Uncle Lon. What's the big idea standing there staring at me, Uncle Lon? Don't call me Uncle Lon. I thought you liked it. Maybe I did. I don't anymore. Ugh. Emmerich calls Bob Branham, Brad Dexter, and says he wants him to collect some debts he has outstanding. So he is hurting for money. In the morning, Gus calls for Dix, and Dahl takes a message. Dix has been dreaming about riding horses on his Kentucky childhood farm. When he wakes, he tells Dahl about the farm, and how they lost it after his father died. He tried to get it back, but never could gamble or steal enough. Later, Dix pays off Cobby and needles him for calling him out in front of Doc. Doc comes in, and he likes Dix for the hooligan. Apparently, the hooker that Doc spent the night with told him that Emrich is broke. While they are talking, Lieutenant Dietrich comes in and sees the two. He walks out, and Cobby chases after him. Dietrich is on the take, and he is warning of a raid. Cobby pays him off. Branham comes back without any money. Emmerich admits that he is broke and has been living well beyond his means and spending a lot of money on Angela. Emmerich spills the whole plan to Branham. Emmerich plans to take all of the loot and rip off Doc and the others. He asks Branham to be his partner for half to take. Branham wants to get the 50000 from Cobby. Back at Cobby's place, Doc is interviewing safecrackers. The man that gets hired is Louis Chiavelli. Lewis recommends Gus from the diner as the wheelman. Doc wants Dix as the hooligan. What about this southerner, this Dix? He impressed me as a very determined man, and far from stupid. Frankly, I don't like the guy. 
But I never saw a hooligan I did like. They're like left-handed pitchers. They all have a screw loose somewhere. Doc also realizes that the money is not coming from Emmerich. Dahl finds a place and moves out. Dix has mixed feelings about her leaving. She wants to stay as well, but they can't commit. Cobby calls Dix to come in for the job. Doc, Dix, Gus, and Lewis meet to go over the plan. Doc has everything worked out. Doc keeps Dix behind to discuss Emmerich. He doesn't trust Emmerich, and he says it's up to him and Dix to get the money after the loot is delivered. Emmerich is getting ready to leave the country as soon as he steals the loot. His sick wife calls him in and gives him the business. She has been sick for a long time and is lonely. Dix and Lewis begin the break-in. Doc and Gus come in another car. Lewis drops down into the underground, and Dix holds the nitro. Lewis breaks through the wall, and after turning off the alarm, lets Doc and Dix inside. Lewis gets through the electronic eye and outer door before beginning to crack the safe. Doc watches Lewis work. Lewis says it will take a lot to blow the safe. When he blows the safe, alarms down the street start ringing. Dix comes in and they decide to continue with the job. It's going to take a lot to blow this baby. Here goes. What's that? Keep going. Hey, Doc, the alarms are going off all over the block. The blast must have shook up the whole system. What do we do? I would hate to leave now. We are so close. Time for finishing what we started. How about you, Louis? It's okay with me. Will Gus hold still? Don't worry about Gus. Lewis gets the safe open as police cars converge on the block. Doc gets the jewels, and the three men head out. When the watchman comes through the back door, Dick slugs him. The watchman drops his gun, and it fires, hitting Lewis. They escape through the underground, taking the wounded man along. Lewis wants to go home, and Gus wants to take him to a guy he knows. Emmerich and Branham are waiting for the robbers. Branham is hitting the booze pretty good. Doc and Dix come in with the loot. Dix punches Branham with his eyes. Emmerich wants a look at the jewels. Emmerich then drops the bomb that he doesn't have the money. Gentlemen, I must admit at this moment I, uh, I'm embarrassed. You mean you haven't got the money, Mr. Emmerich? Oh, I have it. That is, I have the assurance of it. You haven't got it. No, I haven't got the currency right here in my hands. But it's promised by an unimpeachable source. Gentlemen, I'm afraid we were a little hasty. We, uh, we moved too fast. We moved on your word. He asks for a few days to get the money. He wants Doc to leave the jewels with him. Branham pulls the gun. When Doc throws the bag, Dix pulls a gun and shoots Branham. <laughs> Dix is also hit. Dix wants to kill Emmerich, but Doc wants him left alive so he can go to the insurance company and make a deal. Doc and the wounded Dix leave. Lewis's wife and Gus are trying to care for his wounds, but are waiting for a real doctor to come. Emmerich takes Branham's body and dumps it off a bridge. Back at Cobby's, Dix and Doc are waiting. Cobby is freaking out because he has laid out $30,000. How can things go so wrong? How is it possible? One man killed, two others plugged. I'm out 30 grand. We got a load of rocks. We can't even pet them. Why don't you quit crying and give me some bourbon? Gus calls and tells Dix that they are combing the district looking for the robbers. He tells Dix to go see Eddie Donato by the river. The cops come and pick up Gus. Dix and Doc hide out with Eddie for a bit. Emmerich has made a deal with the insurance company. Emmerich is hanging out with his sick wife when the police come to see him. They are questioning him about the body of Branham that they had found in the river. Branham had the collection list on Emmerich's stationery. They ask him for his whereabouts, and he says he was with Angela. After the police leave, he calls Angela and tells her to say that he was with her. When they put a picture of Doc in the paper, Eddie tries to throw them out. Dix won't let him. Our friend Eddie's getting to the place where he'd talk with a little encouragement. Oh, no. I no talk. Gus cut to my belly open. They leave on their own time. People are coming into the police station and reporting the location of the criminals. Dix and Doc head across the rail yard and are stopped by a policeman, Ray Teal. When the cop challenges Doc, Dix beats him down. Not before Doc is hit with a billy club. 
Dix goes straight to Dahl's place. They treat Doc, and Dahl knows that he is wanted. The original taxi driver that dropped off Doc comes in and tells that he dropped Doc off at Cobby's. Kamish calls Lieutenant Dietrich to raid Cobby's place. They also get a report about the patrol cop seeing Doc. Lieutenant Dietrich tries to get info out of Cobby, but he is working both sides. Dietrich breaks Cobby down with a threat of a beating. Cobby says he will rat out Dietrich. The cop gets mad and beats Cobby down until he is ready to fess up. Emmerich goes to see Angela and says she should take a trip. She's really happy about the idea. Oh, <laughs> Cuba, that's not a bad idea. Imagine me on this beach here in my green bathing suit. Yikes. I almost fought a white one the other day, but it wasn't quite extreme enough. I mean, don't get me wrong. If I really went in for the extreme extreme, I would have fought a French one. Run for your lives, girls. The fleet's in. Oh, Uncle Lon, am I excited? Yikes! What can that be this time of night? The commissioner and a bunch of cops begin knocking on the door. The commissioner says he is going to arrest Emmerich. I'm here to arrest you, Emmerich. May I ask what for? Complicity in robbery and in murder. If I were you, Hardy, I'd pick up a few more charges. You might be able to make one of them stand up if you get an imbecile jury and the right judge. Cobby has signed a confession. A detective brings Angela into the main room. Under the threat of jail, Angela breaks Emmerich's alibi. She asked Emmerich if she is still getting her trip. They let Emmerich make a call to his wife. He begins writing a suicide note, but tears it up. He pulls a gun out of a drawer and kills himself. <coughs> they take Gus to jail, and he attacks Cobby, who is in another cell. The police come to arrest Lewis, but they are holding his funeral. <coughs> Doc is getting ready to leave, and he invites Dix along. Doc's plan is to take a taxi to Cleveland. Dix gives him $1,000, and he doesn't want any of the diamonds. And you can have the rest of these stones. That's $50,000 worth. What would I do with them? Can you see me walking into a hawk shop with that stuff? First they think they were phony, and then they'd yell for the riot squad. Hey, wait a minute. You haven't got a heater. I don't want a gun, thank you. I haven't carried a gun since my 20s. You carry a gun, you shoot a policeman. A bad rap, hard to beat. You don't carry a gun, you give up when they hold one on you. Doc gets a taxi and they start speaking German. The man agrees to take him to Cleveland for a $50 tip. Dahl gets a car and Dix tries to leave without her. She insists that she go with him and says she will drive. She forces him to take her along. He can't figure out why she has a flame for him. Why can't I quit you? Doc and the taxi driver stop in a diner to eat. There's a young girl there who is dancing to the jukebox. When her dates won't give her money for the jukebox, Doc gives her money. Nichols is complaining about what a spender. Sure he wants a date. He always wants a date. And where do we go? To a third-run movie. Then we take a ride and blow two tires. Then we come in here and what do you treat me to? Coke. Excuse me, boys. Young lady, I like music too. Will you play me a tune? I sure will. What do you want me to play? You pick him. Gosh, how many have you got here? Not very many. Play what you like. Okay. She dances a special dance for Doc. When she gets close to the window, two cops are looking in. They pick up Doc outside. When they find that his coat is full of diamonds, they know they have the right man. Dix is slowly dying during the drive. He finally passes out. A railroad man helps Dahl find a doctor and carry Dix inside. The doctor calls in the gunshot wound to the police. Dix gets up and escapes to the car with Dahl in tow. Well, he won't get very far, that's for sure. He hasn't got enough blood left in him to keep a chicken alive. The commish briefs the press and Lieutenant Dietrich is being prosecuted as well. The commissioner makes a speech about the police keeping the city from turning into an asphalt jungle. Dix drives through the night and makes it to his beloved Kentucky. He is hallucinating and talking as he drives. They make it to the farm and Dix walks into the pasture followed by Dahl. He drops dead and the horses check him out. World famous short summary. The best laid plans of mice and men. Hope you enjoyed today's show. You can find connections to social media and email on the site at classicmoviereb.com or in the podcast show notes as well. Remember, the show is completely free and independent. If you want to comment, 
suggest a movie, or help out, contact me by email at jec at classicmovierev.com. If you haven't done so already, please jump over to Apple Podcasts and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. Beware the moors. <laughs>